Are you glad to live in a democracy that's governed by popular vote? Um, I think so. I like the United States more than any other country. So sure, every system fine. has the every system has big problems, but I like what we have right now. Well, there's that there's that famous Churchill quote that gets spoken mm -hmm. to death. I I tend to think that maybe democracy is the worst form of government, including all of the ones that we've tried. I, I mean. I, I had a guy on a podcast called Jason Brennan who's written a book called Against Democracy, and he he advocates for so-called epistocracy, that is sort of rule of the of the knowledgeable, which instantly runs into a, to a lot of problems. But I don't know. I, I I think a lot of people see democracy and voting as a sort of unhappy compromise. It's the best we got. Are you more optimistic about voting, or is is that how you view it, uh, how you view it too? I think that's kind of how I view it. I mean, I think that um. I think that having a government that was only ran by like the most educated people, your like technocracy or whatever, mm. I think in theory sounds like probably one of the best ideas. But I mean, in practice, obviously you've got the, the fact that just because somebody is educated in a particular field doesn't mean they might make the best policy decisions. Uh, people are obviously going to be motivated to represent you know, people who are like them in their own kind. And I'm sure you're going to have different representations of people across different educated categories and um yeah, so I mean, obviously that runs into a whole bunch of different issues. I think the system we have right now has a good level of checks and balances and compromises built into it. I just wish that the culture was a bit better. What do you think is the principal justification for having a vote? Right, because some people, I mean, when when voting originally sort of becomes a thing, there's this idea that it's it's like practically beneficial if you allow lots of people who know a lot to vote, then the the, the the best sort of answer will will come about. Then there's a sort of transformation that happens where it's it's no longer sort of like, well, I think that government runs best if you allow me to vote as well. It's sort of, well, no, I have a right to vote, you know, because because you're making rules about me, because you're taxing me, I have a I have a right to have my say, which is a different thing to sort of this will sort of help us hear a, a varied group of voices or whatever. And so some people think that voting is a good thing because it's efficient. Some people say that voting is is the best way to get the best kind of government. Um, some people say that it's because people know best what they want for themselves and therefore everybody should essentially just act like egoists and eventually you get this happy compromise. And some people just say it's like there's this thing called the right to vote that's just like a moral principle. I, I deserve to have a say in the rules that, uh, that, that govern me. I mean, which of those approaches do you take to voting? I think there's a few things that are important. One is it affects all of us and we pay into it generally. Um, right. So, I mean, like, as long as you're living under a thing that you kind of didn't consent to, you're born into the government and you more or less are, are bound by its laws unless you decide to leave, um, since we're all impacted by it and generally we all or we pay tax or we engage with it, we all should have some kind of say in how it's run. I think that's one important thing. I think a second important thing is it forces people that are in charge to make their arguments to an average person. Um, if the way that you run the government and the thing you want to do is so important, then you should be able to justify that to a citizen that has to pay taxes in order to fund your ideas. And then the, um, um, oh shit, I had a third one. That's all I got right now. Well, about this sort of you should be able to explain yourself and justify yourself to people. I mean, some people make the argument, especially these anti-democracy types. Oh, shit. Real quick. Go ahead. The third one was uh, buy-in. Uh, the fact that every single person has a vote, unfortunately, is we're not doing that in terms of executing on that vote right now because not everybody exercises their vote. Um, I think the buy-in is important as well. Like every single person should feel like they are somewhat bought into the, the project of the United sure. States that have a vote. So, so I, I, what do you think about the, um, I think like Australia... Force people to vote, to vote, or vote right? Like, fine, yeah. do you think that's a good idea? No, because I I feel like I feel like not voting is as much expressing your right to vote but then as I, voting I think itself. Is. As far as I'm aware, like you're allowed to go and like spoil the ballot, right? You're allowed to go and sort of vote for nobody, but you have to show up and and register that. Because I agree with you that I mean, the right to vote needs the right not to vote. It's like saying have, you have a right to free speech, but you must say something. A right to free speech means a right to silence as well. Mm -hmm. And so a right to right to vote must mean a right not to vote. But you said a moment ago this buy-in, this fact that you know we're not doing it very well because not everybody's not everybody's voting. I think that's always going to be the case. People feel very pessimistic about their vote. Even people who do vote don't really think that their vote is going to make a difference, right? Like yeah. people say, your vote matters. Like they're essentially lying to you. Like it actually doesn't. But we just sort of live in a better society if people act as though it does, right? It's one I mean, of those. I mean, kind of. Fake I mean, that's truths. weird. I mean, it kind of does, right? You think? Like, there's one like a neuron in your brain doesn't matter, but all of them do. <laughs> and if enough yeah, of them but, stop working, I mean, that, you have a huge problem, right? That's the thing. I mean, if you're in a decision where like, if you've got like this really tired neuron that sort of doesn't want to do its job anymore and it says, I'm going to retire, and it doing so just has no effect on my brain, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of, I wouldn't judge it for going like, 
yeah, sure. I mean, what's the, what's the point of me even bothering? Now, if, if all of my neurons did that, that'd be disastrous. Well, you'd have to then, right? It's a universal principle. You would have to make sure that that particular thing knows that it has to act in such a way because if you allow it for one, you must allow it for others. And then when that thought becomes pervasive, now you've destroyed the... An argument that I've heard in a, in a different context, this is about sort of uh, your your purchasing power. So things like buying animal products or contributing to, to companies that you think you should be boycotting. And they were trying to make a point about how tiny your impact is. And they imagined some ludicrous scenario where like it was something like there's there's this like child tied up to a torture device or something and the amount of torture that they receive is uh tied to a decibel meter that's on the table right so there's it's it's recording the level of sound in the room and the louder the sound the more the torture and in front of the speaker is a television which is playing live footage of like a, a football game and the 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 sort of crowd is the one making the noise which determines how much that that child is going to suffer now you're a person in the crowd at the football game and you know the scenarios going on your decision to like yell in a yell in a cheer along with like a hundred thousand other people who are doing the same thing doesn't make a difference like it's not going to change the decibel meter it's not going to increase the amount of torture and yet still some people might want to say that you'd be morally culpable for doing so and obviously if everybody were to stop cheering, it would be better. But I, I think it it's can't. It can't be this way. It seems like a paradox. It can't be. It's not a paradox. It can't be this way. Like the, you, I mean, it can't be the case that it makes no difference. It can't be the case that people are allowed to think that way. Um, right. But it's, that's interesting. It's not. It's not. It can't. Like it's not. It can't be the case. It's. It can't be the case that people should be allowed to think that that's the case. It can't be because if it is, then government fails, and then we have nothing. Yeah. We go back to. <sighs> I read this book recently called. Uh, uh, I think it was culture and conflict in the Middle East. Sure, and it talks a lot about um, about these concepts of how tribes were organized um, throughout the Arab world and the Middle East, and how they managed to function without states. And uh, it's very, very, very interesting to see how another total society can be organized. The fascinating part about the mm. way that the tribal stuff was organized in the Middle East was you had a wholly decentralized way of approaching decision making, but the decision making was always consistent throughout how um, all of these tribes function. A lot of it rests on this concept called balanced opposition, that the way that you would fight with other people and the way that you would defend your tribe or your land or your area had to do with like distance from uh, nearest kin. So like if I'm fighting with you um, and and you're, uh, we, we both have like the same great grandparent, right? The two branches of us might, uh, let's say you come and you steal something of mine. Well, my branch might come and, and, and get vengeance on you or take it back or, or find a way for you to make uh, uh, reparations to me to, to make things right. But even if we're in that struggle, if, if somebody five grandfathers from us, another tribe were to mess with us, we would instantly forget our differences and we would come together with other people um, as part of that lineage. And then we would all go and we would get into conflict with that. Sure. And this way of, of having it so that, um, you know, brothers f would always fight with brothers, cousins would fight with cousins against other, like you would always follow this line. What it ensured was this like decentralized process of decision-making that actually balanced the opposition on both sides such that it allowed for some level of stability without any government, without any top-down leadership, because every single individual knew that they had to they had to satisfy their function. Mm. Because uh, for instance, if, if you did get into a fight and I was your cousin and we were fighting somebody with, with, with a, um, a patrilineage that was farther far enough away, if I don't stand up to protect you, you wouldn't stand to protect me and i knew that so i had to and everybody was looking at each other knowing that that's how it had to yeah. act now we've replaced that form of society with more evolved state structures okay but the state structure relies on things like a constitution that we all believe in that's in substitution of familial lines i don't have to be related to you to fight for your right but we have to be willing to participate in that form of government because if we don't and if we all stand around and look at each other that's arguably one of the weaker forms of our system that you have like free rider problems you don't have free rider problems in tribal societies if you don't stand up and and, and protect and defend your family or your tribe or your kinship when you're supposed to then you're you're left in the wilderness and you die you get eaten because you have nobody to protect you so when i say it can't be this way 
It cannot be that people are unwilling to stand up and vote or have the participation in democracy that they need to in order to ensure that the system functions. Because if enough people stop because they think, oh, well, my one vote doesn't matter, mm. then okay, well, we'll th if that's the case, then what happens is we have to switch to another society where your one decision does matter. And that's because if you don't step up and are willing to fight and die for your particular family, you're going to get killed by somebody else. Mm. I don't want to go back to that society. So we have to tell people that it is correct that if you walk into a, a fruit stand and you steal one orange, the guy's not going to starve to death. But if everybody looks, if everybody looks around and they see you steal an orange, you don't get in trouble for it. Well, tomorrow the guy's not going to have any oranges because everybody's going to steal one. So that's yeah. yeah sorry, oh no. Well, no, this is the attraction of the the sort of categorical imperative. Yes, to, yeah. To sort of just act in the way that you would like everybody else to act in in similar circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. And and I totally understand that. But it does seem. I mean, I I use the term paradox for for a few different reasons. But like, it does seem to me that. Well, I understand that's the case. Like, suppose you knew for a fact how many people were voting for a particular candidate, and you, you literally knew for a fact that if you get out of bed and go to the ballot box, you're going to be adding on another vote that, that doesn't make a difference. It doesn't seem sort of, you know, morally inexcusable for me, even if I support the system of democracy that I live in, to be like, well, then I'm going to stay at home because I know that this is the case. The problem is that that's paradoxical because that's like always the situation you're in, basically. And yet, if everybody acted like that, it would be a total disaster. Right? So I, I think that it's—I don't think it's paradoxical. I think that what you're describing is a very real free rider problem where somebody can essentially like yeah, yeah. join a system and, and have fun and not really do anything to participate positively in it. So in a vacuum where it's an, an individual actor, I think that you're right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, this is almost like a, like a rule versus act utilitarian says it like, you know, in a singular event that if you do this particular thing, yeah, there's no harm, no foul. But then if we understand that that is the case, that if one person could act that way, then on a more abstract level, when all of us are involved, well, now we have a responsibility to make sure that people don't act that way. So when we, if we think that a friend is going to stay home and not vote because they know that their vote doesn't matter, well, we need to bully the fuck out of that person, make sure, hey, you need to get the fuck out and we yeah. need to go vote. Like, we have to do this. It's part of our civic duty, our civic responsibility. This is you what, can't think that you can get away with not voting because then other people are going to think they're going to get away with voting. Even if that means mm. going to take you out the street and kick your ass. We want everybody to know that you have to participate in your democracy. Yeah. It's so weird. It's almost like it's it doesn't make a difference if you don't vote, but if we like recognize that fact and act in accordance with it, then it suddenly starts mattering that you don't vote. It's 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 weird. It's so it's so weird to me. I mean, like your vote doesn't matter, but the idea of you voting is everything. Mm. That's the issue, and the idea is what carries from person to person. Even if an individual might not, if you're sick and you stay home or whatever, that's fine. But if you don't think that you have that obligation, then that's because that society is allowing you to think you don't have that obligation. And there's nothing special about you. That means other people think that they don't have the obligation, which means it doesn't work anymore. This is what morality does so well as like a human concept of sort of like, you know, oh well, why can't I do this one tiny little little thing? Oh, because it's wrong, and that that's it. It's just like it's wrong, and as long as you embody that. Uh, uh, as long as you internalize that, it's like, okay, society functions well, because even though if you fully rationalized it, you might be like, well, there's no reason, there's no societal harm in me doing this one particular act. But if everybody acted like that, it would be a disaster. So we just have this like rule that develops, like, just don't do it. Just don't. It does matter, even if you can't quite figure out why. But like, here's a question. Um, suppose that there's an election and there's like an objectively immoral candidate to vote for, like an actual just super authoritarian fascist or like whatever kind of thing you don't like you know wh whatever it may be just evil personified and there's an election for that candidate and another good candidate and again you know that the evil candidate is going to win you know infallibly that they're going to get thousands more votes than the good candidate you go to the ballot box anyway because you're in the mood for it and you vote for the evil candidate knowing that if you didn't vote he'd still win whatever have you done something wrong Um, whether or not you've done something wrong, truly, you're just asking me a, like a question about my normative ethics at that point. I don't know. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, you're at, like, it in there. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, like if I think that you should live a virtuous life where you embody certain principles and you always act in accordance with those, even if you might not achieve some particular mm. end, or even if you don't have some sure. ontological imperative to do, I don't, I hate sure. normative ethics. So fuck that. I don't have an answer. <laughs> um, I, I would probably, I would probably cuck out to somewhere of the virtuous point to where like, even if you are, even if you know that there might not necessarily be a positive end, you should embody a particular virtue. Sure, I think that's because, sensible. Yeah. In repeated circumstances, you are going to want 
want to be able to, to rise. And every single time you perform a certain action, if you decide not to vote or vote evilly in one sense, you're probably making a mark. You're sculpting a block that's mm -hmm. starting to look slightly different. And with every negative action, it takes you further and further away from whatever virtue you wish to embody. So, I mean, like you, you, should, yeah. you can always it, do the right thing. It's so yeah. complicated. And, and, and you're right. I don't want to, I mean, we did a sort of ethical chat the last time mm -hmm. we spoke. I actually want to talk about other things, but it becomes really I will, interesting. I will say something that you, um, something that you had said right before this though. Um, uh, oh fuck, what was it? Right before you, you mentioned the voting. Um, if you knew that a particular candidate was going to lose, what did you say right before that? Oh, um, one thing that's very difficult is our society has gotten very complicated. And I say mm. this because the more abstract things become, the less your intuitions work. Um, so sure. for ethical yeah. principles, that's fair enough. Yeah, I would say less than one percent of society would be comfortable like watching a child like crying in the corner as he's forced to sew, you know, a particular piece yeah, of clothing yeah, yeah. for you. But if you put enough distance between me and that person, or enough like layers of yeah, abstraction, like yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, then all of a sudden, well, you know, if I, I don't know the kid over there that's making my shirt or whatever. Um, the more abstracted everything becomes, whether it's through time, um, meaning like it's a it's a penalty way down on the uh, mm. way down the road, or whether it's through space, it's only way you know away from us. Um, th those the intuitions begin to fail us because oftentimes those particular bads are very abstract, but the goods are very concrete. I have nice clothes right now. Mm -hmm. I feel that. I don't, there may be some bad like further down the road, but I can't, I can't intuitively sense that out. So cognitively, we have to commit to way more uh, like abstract intellectual philosophy, you know, ethics, whatever thought to, to get there. Um, and the same is true of, of like um, of like epistemic practice too, or whatever. That like if we want to argue about um, if we want to argue about whether or not I can fly. I, that's a belief that can be very quickly weeded out of society. We can jump out the window right now, and afterwards, at least two people in this room will know whether or not humans can fly, and then we never have that belief again. Mm. But if we want to argue about the realities of like COVID or a vaccine or public health or anything like that, well, you can afford to be lo wrong for much longer because the penalties for making an incorrect decision there are so much further removed from the actual decision mm. that your intuitions don't actually carry you to to what's good there. So when I talk about like the voting thing, that's why I said it's so important to focus on it. We have to like like uh, cognitively approach this on an intellectual level to force people to do it because the the, the harms and everything are so abstract. Who cares if one person just doesn't vote? You know the sec the second thing you said about democracy, the second point, like sort of in its favor, uh, was that look, if if somebody is making a rule that affects you, they should have to be answerable to that. They should have to explain it to you, and you should have to sort of assent or consent to what they're doing. The criticism people raise to this uh, to to talk about your other point is they say this is kind of a little bit like somebody flying a plane and trying to figure out like you know what the what the pilot should be doing and the pilot needs to decide whether to press you know the 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 bloody A120 button or the AW30 button that's on the console somewhere right and and they say all right well you know let's go and ask the passengers what do they think and even if you could sit them down and ideally, you'd say, well, ideally, they'd be educated in how a plane works. And we'd educate our our, our sort of passengers in, in how plane works. And so they'd be able to make informed decisions. Two things are the case. Firstly, not everybody's going to pay attention. Not everybody's going to be good at that. But secondly, the plane is already in the air and flying. And if you've got a bunch of people who obviously don't know the difference, but somehow start still having sort of debates about it and start debating about, you know, they think that the person who wants to press one button is evil and immoral and they actually want to crash the plane and they hate the plane and they wish it turned around and this kind of stuff. You'd be like, this is ridiculous. You don't ask passengers to fly the plane. You ask the pilots to do it because they know what they're talking about. People see this, uh, people use this as an analogy for democracy too. What do you think of that given your earlier statement that, you know, governments and elected officials should have to be answerable to, to people. I think it was democratic societies that built planes. Hmm. So we can look at it at the metaphorical sense, which we will, mm -hmm. but if we look at it at the very real practical sense, democracies today have built planes and they already decide who fly planes. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that somebody might pose that as a hypothetical, like, well, how does the how do we decide what's nice? Like, mm. We actually already have. That's already been solved for. So it's funny that on a hypothetical to test the limits of democracy, it plays out in real life and we actually already have. We have an incredibly safe um, culture of air travel in the United States. Um, metaphorically, I, I mean, like, I would agree that this would be bad to leave up to direct democracy, but I feel like the challenges to this are that that that, that challenge is a little bit um, juvenile, and that like okay, sure, 
from like a very basic sense, uh, you know, if George Bush tomorrow needed to decide whether or not to nuke Iraq, I don't know if I would want the average American to vote yes or no, you know, on their phones to right. figure out if we're actually going to fire the nukes or not. Um, I, I think that part of what a democracy does is you don't need to have people that know how to do every single thing. You just need to have people that are informed enough to vote on people that will do mm. those things. So we have a representative democracy, right? So yeah, um, the goal exactly. wouldn't be that ha every single person in the plane is voting on what button to press. The goal might be like, okay, well, we're going to sit around and listen. And these two or three people want to get up and they want to make the arguments why they think they're the best to make that decision. And then you would sit there and you'd say, okay, well, I trust this guy or I trust that guy. Mm. And then at the end of the day, you have to go with what your citizens vote for. Um, it, sometimes the plane might have turbulence. Sometimes the plane will fly smoothly. It might be the case that the plane crashes, but for the societies that haven't done it democratically, they haven't even built planes yet. They haven't gotten off the ground. And then they're sitting, and some people are like, well, look, like these guys don't have these same problems. They don't have the same opportunities um, to mm, stretch mm -hmm, the limits mm -hmm. of the metaphor. Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah. No, I, I like that. They, they don't have the same problems, but they also don't have the same opportunities. So that's quite a great rejoinder, I think, that could probably be used in a, in a number of different uh, circumstances. I mean, I, I've, I've heard responses to this thought that are like, okay, yeah, you shouldn't, the people shouldn't like fly the plane. They shouldn't sit in the cockpit, but they should. It should be the passengers who are deciding where the plane's going, right? It probably shouldn't be the pilots who are sort of hired to serve yeah. the passengers. The passengers should get final say in the direction of the plane. Yeah, and most importantly, um, a lot of uh, a lot of philosophy problems, a lot of hypotheticals, mm. are actually only challenging because of the way that they're phrased. And if you think for like a slight moment, or if you wheel it back a little bit before the hypothetical, the solution can actually come before the problem. So the thing about the plane too is that like part of the reason why the plane works and because the people are there is because the people are all somewhat consenting already that when we take off, this is how the decision-making process is going to go. So if you've agreed to it before the plane mm. is off, well, then once you're in the air, whatever process you've agreed to is kind of as you continue to go along is, is what you are consenting to. Mm. Um, People say things like, well, how could it possibly be okay that you're doing a thing democratically that 49% of the population might be opposed to? And that's because the 49% are consenting to be ruled by the 51% because they know that on the next vote, they might be part of the 51%. Like a democracy yeah. isn't just that we're voting for things that we want and then when we get what we want, we follow through on them. Democracy means that sometimes we're not gonna get what we want, sometimes in excruciating ways, sometimes in horrible ways or things we really want, but we make those compromises because the only way society works is if we can move along without needing 100% conformity in society for things to, to move forward. Mm. But the problem famously with political consent is that, for example, being in a democracy, you could say, look, you're in the system. You, you, you are consenting to, to being ruled by the majority by virtue of being in a democracy. But how would I not consent to that? I mean, I, I guess I could like move, but maybe I'm too young or don't have enough money or something like that. And it's like, maybe I, maybe I don't like democracy, but if I have a chance to vote for how I think the world should, the, the country should be organized, I'm going to do that because that's like my only recourse. But I'd actually rather not be, I don't think it's moral that this is the system that we live in. I mean, is there a meaningful way in which you can rescind that consent? Uh, no, but that, that, that type of, that, I think, again, that's like a juvenile understanding of like positive and negative freedoms. Like mm -hmm. if you want, like, let, like, let's say that we created the, the perfect libertarian escape. Okay. You're born, you turn 18. You're like, you know what? I didn't consent to being in this society at all. I actually would like to enjoy ultimate freedom and I don't consent to any of this. Okay. And then you push a button, you could be teleported into the middle of an Island and you're all alone and now you starve to death. Hmm. And you're like, okay, well, this is bullshit. Yeah. I don't want to be alone and starve to death. Obviously, this is what I meant. Okay, well, then we'll drop you off on an island with a tribe of people who might capture you and eat you. Okay, well, this is bullshit. I don't like this. Okay, well, like eventually, I think that in all these hypotheticals, um, depending on when the libertarian catches what you're doing, mm -hmm. you're going to mm -hmm. basically end up reconstructing some form of like non-consenting government. Because like I said before, even with the tribal stuff, um, from that book about culture and conflict in the Middle East, like every single, even on a decentralized absolute freedom, like everybody's able to do exactly what they want kind of structure, every individual person knows that they have an obligation, uh, a decentralized, democratically arrived at obligation to defend their family, their honor, their their kinsmen, because if they don't, they're not going to be protected and they're going to be tossed. So there's an illusion sometimes that, well, I don't consent to this government. That's fine, but you have to consent to some form of organization. Human beings aren't islands. We need other people to survive and thrive. Mm.